So there's this movie. It's about this guy who gets to fight all these other people, like in a video game, but instead, it's in real life. It's so he can get with this hot girl who's super cool. I mean, he is kind of a scumbag. He's not very nice and does a lot of stuff that makes him seem like a bit of a jerk in the movie. He's dating this high schooler, and then he kind of cheats on her by pursuing the cooler girl. She totally forgives him for it, though, and helps him get with the cooler girl at the end, so it's fine. It's such a cool movie. My description is totally not doing it justice. The fights are so fun, and the editing is engaging and coherent, and the acting is perfect, and it's just great. Recently, I did something you should never do. Unless you are actively trying to destroy your notifications for days and maybe farm it for content. I got involved in TikTok discourse over Scott Pilgrim versus the world. The original video that got me started on this project was done in that over-the-top way that's so popular on TikTok. It's designed to drive engagement and get rage responses, and that's about it. In the now-deleted video, the original creator made a sweeping statement about Scott Pilgrim vs. the World and how it ruined a generation of boys. And also how it doomed a generation of girls with colorful hair to being the manic pixie dream girl in those boys' fantasies. It was, of course, taken very seriously by people who then swarmed the original creator with replies. The nature of the internet is that anytime you say anything, even as a joke, people will come after you about it. I say this as someone who often takes a video that was meant as a joke and uses it to talk about bigger issues, so I'm not necessarily hating on the practice here. There were tons of replies arguing that she was wrong and bad for saying what she said. There were a lot of info dumps about how actually, if you read the comics, the author's original intent was blah, 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 blah. Now that is the kind of response that got me wanting to jump in. This is an argument that I have seen come around again and again and again online, so I wanted to move my part of that discussion from TikTok over to a more longer form platform to say everything that I need to say about it. I'm not sharing the original video because as I said before, it is gone. I didn't download it before it disappeared, so that's on me. I don't wanna use any specific videos done by other TikTokers in the response video because this video isn't really to argue back and forth with specific other creators and I don't wanna single out anybody when a lot of people jumped in on this. Let's talk about the original statement and the repeated idea that was brought up in response to it from fans of Scott Pilgrim. Scott Pilgrim is the protagonist, sure, but everybody in the world of the story criticizes him for how he behaves, so it's not like it glorifies his behavior. It is meant to criticize him, so when he becomes a better person in the end, you can see his character development. There's an often quoted quote by French filmmaker Francois Truffaut. It goes something like, there's no such thing as an anti-war movie. What it is commonly understood to mean is that any film attempting to be anti-war inevitably makes war look in some way cool or good. They do this through awesome action scenes or showing the intense familial bonds that form between people who fight in those wars. Sure, you may be doing war crimes, but you will forge friendships that will last a lifetime. They also often show a version of masculinity that many people aspire to, even as the film is technically showing you the awful things those characters must go through for that masculine display of stoicism or heroism. A band of brothers united by whatever this particular film has decided is their purpose. Cards on the table, I broadly agree with the Truffaut quote, though I would go so far as to widen it to a much broader statement on movies as a whole. It is incredibly difficult to create a film that is engaging to the viewer while also making the subject matter not look aspirational or at least rad as hell. A movie is a visual representation of a story. Stories have a beginning, middle, and end, typically. Exceptions made for things like Marvel movies that never truly end because every one is a cliffhanger that leads to the next movie. Even the TV shows are just cliffhangers that lead to the next movie. To write a story about a character learning a lesson, you must first show them with the flaws that lesson will eventually try to fix. The very tricky part is not subverting your own intent with a character's flaws and whatever lesson they must learn in the end. If they are super cool for most of the movie, even while being fundamentally flawed, is the movie really criticizing that person? Does the end of the story resolve with that person behaving differently or do they still act the exact same way they did before? Do you see where I'm going with this? If you're a fan of the Scott Pilgrim vs. the World movie or the original comic series it was based on, I'm sure you are poised and ready to tear me to pieces in the comments of this video, but I ask that you at least hear me out before you do. I will specifically be talking about Movie Scott Pilgrim because that is the one that made $49.3 million at the box office. It has seeded itself through pop culture and become a cult classic movie, even outside of nerdy interest circles. People who have never picked up a graphic novel know who Scott Pilgrim is from this thing, so talking about his original character arc in print is pointless unless I am comparing the two things, which I am not. 
The film version is the one that more people would likely be familiar with or influenced by, and so authorial intent for the original comic or how effective that version is doesn't really matter for the purposes of this video. That goes for any other work referenced in this video that is based on something else like a novel or a comic. So did Scott Pilgrim ruin a generation of boys? To talk about that, I first want to talk about the Fight Club effect. This is a phenomenon where a movie plays at being a critique, but reinforces the positive aspects of the thing ostensibly being criticized. Fight Club is, as many people would have you believe, a critique of toxic masculinity and how it turns men into fight-loving fascist terrorists, but is it? A brief search returns more articles than I care to count about how fans misunderstood the film by following Tyler's ethos and trying to emulate him. Lines like, it's only after we've lost everything that we're free to do anything, fill the script, said with the charisma and style of a late 90s Brad Pitt. Hearing these lines over and over again has the vibe of hearing daily affirmations from a self-help guru, which is essentially what Tyler is in the story. If you squint your eyes a bit, you can maybe see a version of the movie that's a critique of reliance on self-help gurus. It can simultaneously help you with your lack of purpose, but also easily turn into a near worship level of obsession with them and destroy your life in other ways. We see through the eyes of the unnamed narrator as he watches ultra cool guy Tyler Durden. Tyler is cool, carefree, and hot as fuck. He gets the things that the narrator wants, but never has because he is too held back by the lack of purpose in a corporate consumerist society. Only after he loses everything when his apartment burns down is he free to do whatever he wants. Whatever he wants winds up being living with Tyler in a rundown house and starting a fight club with him that eventually snowballs into a terrorist organization blowing up buildings. And then the big reveal. He was the cool guy all along, the charismatic leader of this group of men who hang on his every word and will literally die for him, was just a normal guy like you. He was so wrapped up in thinking he could never be the cool guy that he created this character of Tyler to project it onto in his own mind. That character set him free from his old life metaphorically and, well, literally. Crucially, the main character had it in him to be Tyler from the beginning because he was Tyler. He tries to disavow the now terrorist group Project Mayhem and the extremes that it goes to and is literally dragged back in to witness the culmination of their efforts with a massive bombing. He symbolically destroys the Tyler part of himself and watches the destruction as a new man, one who has his life more figured out than ever before. He even seems to get the girl in the end as a reward for his efforts. The girl who has existed up till this point as a prop to validate the desirability of Tyler Durden. They show us how letting the Tyler part of ourselves loose on the world can bring us sex objects who will stick around no matter how awful we actually are to them day to day. Because he's not actually mean to her, it's just his wild side overriding his decisions for a time. In the end, when he finally is nice to her, she will stick around because, well, He's being nice now, right? All the other times he was horrible and abusive don't matter because he's apparently changed. Our narrator is functionally the tiny voice of conscience in the mind of Tyler Durden, the real main character. Then in the end, he can wash his hands of the whole thing because he's actually not that bad. Crucially, his life was improved by the whole experience. He ends the movie having overcome his split mind and crisis of identity. Tyler and everything he did made the narrator's life better. It doesn't surprise me that people watch this movie and come away from it thinking positively about Tyler Durden. It isn't a critique of toxic masculinity to show the subject of the film struggling with his life, then leaning into toxicity as far as humanly possible and eventually getting better mental health as a result. This isn't a critique of anything really, or at least not a good one. There are no anti-war movies and all that. The way the story comes to a close reinforces the messaging from the opening. He's lost everything and now the possibilities are endless. Talking about this movie as if it is truly a criticism of anything is disingenuous. When a character's coolness outweighs their flaws, it is really hard to show how they can learn any sort of lesson. You can take this phenomenon and graft it onto a lot of movies. Wolf of Wall Street is a favorite of crypto bros who want to be like Jordan Belfort because he looks cool. Despite the movie ending with him getting kind of punished. The real Jordan Belfort got into crypto stuff if that's any indication of how much that missed the mark. It made him look like a cool and aspirational figure for most of the runtime. Sure, he gets punished, but he's still rich and can do whatever he wants. 
and did in real life. He's still out there scamming people to this day. The Dark Knight shows Batman utilizing intrusive surveillance of Gotham City to fight the Joker. Sure, he's criticized for it by characters in the movie, but ultimately it serves his goal and saves the city. So is it really that bad? Or is it only bad when the wrong people do it? We're told one thing, that the thing is bad, and then shown a conclusion that completely contradicts it, that the thing was useful and good and helped save the city. My choice of Fight Club as my main example of this is just because it is a very well-known and enduring example. If I brought in television shows, I could just as easily talk about South Park. Or more recently, shows like Rick and Morty or BoJack Horseman when their fandoms were in their earliest stages. Scott Pilgrim vs. The World is a movie about a boring loser adult guy in his early 20s. He becomes obsessed with a girl he knows nothing about because she looks cool and he sees her in his dreams. He cheats on the 17-year-old he is dating with said cooler girl, then finally is forced by another person to break up with the teenage Knives Chow because he doesn't have the stones to do it on his own. He must confront all the exes of cool girl Ramona Flowers and physically fight them in a visual representation of what Ramona at one point refers to as her baggage if he wants to be with her. Scott is childish, at one point panicking over Ramona's dying of her own hair and proclaiming that it means she must be fickle and change things in her life on a whim. He fixates on how many exes Ramona has and how badly those relationships seem to have ended. His insecurity is his own baggage, but it has never made a problem for her the way the existence of her ex-partners is for him. They are baggage that he must deal with if he wants to be with her, literally fighting against it constantly. This insecurity he has is one of those flaws that the movie will probably show him overcoming, right? Well, not really. If we're going with the video game fights as a visual representation of relationship baggage from exes, then shouldn't Ramona have to defeat Envy Adams in this big fight? Scott's ex who cheated on him, which led to him being so insecure he gets with a teenager to feel special? And what baggage specifically does the fight address for Ramona? What about her relationship to these people is still hanging over her and affecting the way she handles relationships in her present life? Except that they just exist. That is a misogynistic podcast bro's idea of relationship baggage with a woman. Her body count is the baggage. This visual metaphor has a lot of potential and I think that's the thing that frustrates me the most about it. Ramona loved Gideon and he neglected her. Scott being attentive and paying attention to her wants and needs is the real life thing that he can do to defeat that baggage. Represented by a cool fight scene, of course. But that's not what happens. None of the other exes have some type of lasting effect on Ramona, except that they are her exes. Thus, they must be overcome. Scott's defeat of Gideon isn't a metaphorical stand-in for him helping Ramona heal. The defeat of the big bad is for Scott to learn to respect himself and defeat Gideon because he's a dick. So we're left with a story that tells us a woman's baggage in a relationship is a constant struggle for a man to physically fight even though all he wants is to be a nice guy and his baggage is non-existent. Despite us actually seeing how much the thing with Envy actually affected him. It damaged him so much that he took advantage of a very young girl when he was at a low point. Through the entire movie, Scott is pulled over and over into situations that drive the plot forward. Until the very end, he doesn't make any decision to move things along without somebody behind him pushing or in the front of him challenging him to a battle. Scott is dragged, kicking and screaming through the plot, literally having to die to get a minuscule amount of character development and becoming a better person. All while stylistically, the movie is showing us how cool he can be, how interesting and fun his life is. You can say all you want that you know he's not a good dude and he's not a hero, just the protagonist. But you cannot argue with the absolute fact the movie rewards him with the girl of his dreams after all that time spent jokingly showing us everybody ragging on him for being a boring loser. If you just keep going, you'll wear the girl down and you'll eventually get with her in the end and you won't really have to change much about yourself at all. Just say you're sorry to the people you hurt and ask, So are we all good? Never felt better and they will forgive everything and fight with you to get the thing that you desire. After all, you're a nice guy. Film shows us how crummy and boring Scott is, but also shows us all the cool people around him who are inexplicably obsessed with him. Envy even comes back specifically to be the ex-girlfriend who is jealous that he moved on. That's it, that's her only point in the story. And Scott gets to turn his back on her and get the final say because she is the villain of his story the way Gideon is for Ramona. So to answer the original question that started me down this path, 
No, Scott Pilgrim didn't ruin a generation of boys. I don't think it's possible to pin misogynistic views on relationships to any one piece of media. But it is also wrong to claim that this movie is some sort of critique of the main character or journey of self-discovery. It's a movie about a dude who eventually figures out that he doesn't really have to do much work at all to have better relationships. If you're a Scott Pilgrim fan and you stuck around to the end of this video, I at least thank you for hearing me out. I understand that this movie is widely adored and I truly do not want to make anybody feel bad or anything for loving it. I enjoy the heck out of it, even with everything I've said here. I just don't think it's necessary to justify bad or ineffective messaging and things I like for me to like them. You don't have to have the moral high ground to justify liking something or disliking it for that matter. Both thoughts can exist at the same time in your mind. Acknowledging faults in the things that we love is healthy and good. Being critical of the things that we love so much that we will argue endlessly about them is important, I think. Nobody is bad for liking Scott Pilgrim, or Fight Club for that matter. Though I and every other femme presenting person who has ever taken a film class can tell you that Fight Club was a great litmus test for guys in class with us. This whole idea can be applied to more pieces of media than I can really name. In fact, naming specific examples feels like it takes away from how pervasive it actually is in visual storytelling. Any list I made would inevitably be inadequate and just wind up being a wall of titles with no context to each example. That's part of why these conversations about media devolve so quickly on short form content platforms. You can't get into the intricacies of something in a 15 or 60 second video or in a few sentences of a tweet. You always wind up doing multi-part videos or long tweet threads, but at that point you're just blogging snippets that are easy to take out of context and people do take them out of context. Thank you so much for sticking around to the end of this video. I had so many thoughts on this subject that it was pretty hard for me to form them into a single project. I cut out dozens of tangents about the Ouroboros of capitalism and patriarchy and the missed opportunities of some films to actually show how these things affect men and how to escape that cycle. I want to really thank the fine folks of the Bechtelcast subreddit for recommending movies for this project. I didn't wind up citing a lot of them because it felt like beating a very dead horse, but I will throw up some of the suggestions on screen. I watched a good amount of these movies while writing and rewriting the script, and they gave me so much material to work with. They really helped me form my thoughts into the final version. If you liked this video, I would really appreciate it if you left a like so I do not get lost in the unknowable depths of the YouTube algorithm. If you would like access to monthly updates, behind the scenes content, cut content, and more, then head over to my Patreon at patreon.com slash writingwomen, where you can pledge for just $2 a month. Or if you are feeling generous, you can pledge a little bit more. That is all from me today, folks. I will see you next time.